Okay, so now we come to what I think personally is the best poem in uh, the IGCSE anthology. And it's certainly, um, I would say, the one that most has been written about. So if you feel that your knowledge of the poem is still slightly lacking, even after this video, um, then do go online and, and have a look. There are plenty of resources uh, about this poem. A lot has been written about it. Anyway, without further ado, let's uh, let's start to look at it. So um, it's called Ode on Melancholy by John Keats. Um, and uh, the first thing to note probably, again, is the title and an ode. And an ode is a poem um, that is uh, that is praising something generally. So it's a, it's a sort of a, a praise poem. And what is Keats praising here? Well, slightly surprisingly, perhaps he's praising melancholy. Um, and melancholy... Um, as we know, is a sort of an extreme sadness. And in this poem, Keats explains the way in which um, melancholy and beauty are so closely entwined and the fact that you cannot have one without the other. Um, right, let's, uh, let's begin with uh, stanza one. Um, Keats begins with this uh, very powerful imperative. He says, no, no, go not to Lethe. Okay, so let's note here um, the imperative tone. Um, that just is like uh, that means it's a it's an instruction really. It's like you know, put your phone down, do your homework. They're both examples of imperatives uh, you may have um, may have heard before. But here he's saying uh, using this imperative, no, no, go not to Lethe. Now Lethe uh, is one of the five rivers in Hades, which is the classical underworld. And this river in particular is important because it is the river of forgetfulness. Okay, so Keats is saying, do not forget. Now, what is it that we're not supposed to forget? Well, it goes back to the to the title, the melancholy. We're not meant to sort of drown our melancholy um, in you know in, in other other ways and in, in ways of avoiding it he's saying instead we should be embracing it and he's going to go on and uh, and talk about other ways that um, people could choose to avoid melancholy but that they shouldn't so he's saying no no go not to Lethe do not forget your melancholy neither which is another way of uh, here of saying nor nor twist wolfsbane tight rooted for its poisonous wine now here he's saying that um, not only should you not sort of enter this river of forgetfulness, nor should you try and sort of drug yourself to either um, avoid life, you know, if you drink poisonous wine, um, that could lead to could lead to death, um, or or to sort of drug yourself to sort of forget um, forget your melancholy again. Um, and he goes on and gives another example: nor suffer thy pale forehead to be kissed by nightshade. Nightshade is another type of, um, of powerful poison. So again, he's saying this is what not to do. Um, ruby grape of Proserpine. Proserpine is a, um, a goddess um, of the underworld and is sort of associated with, uh, with death. So all of these are actually um, sort of saying uh, similar similar types of, of, of things. He's saying that actually we should not um, be looking for a way out of melancholy. Okay, and he um, and he continues with a, with another imperative: make not your rosary of yew berries. Now, a rosary obviously is a, is a sort of set of beads for for prayer, and yew berries again are um, you probably could guess by now another type of poison and he's saying don't make um, a sort of a religion of, of these poisons don't make your way of life one in which you avoid melancholy where you try and find ways out of melancholy whether that is through um, the river of forgetfulness through trying to forget whether it's through um, sort of you know ultimately I think Keats is alluding here to suicide to, to sort of choosing death over melancholy um, and and these other um, sort of ways in which we could perhaps sort of avoid sadness, um, he's, he's suggesting that actually that is not the right way to, to deal with it. And we'll find out later in the poem exactly why uh, he's saying that and why this is not, according to Keats, 
the way to, to be. But first he has some more um, striking images here. He's saying, nor let the beetle nor the death moth be your mournful psyche. Nor the, nor the downy owl, a partner in your sorrow's mysteries. So here he has even more advice for the, for the reader. Um, and the beetle and the death moth and the, and the downy owl, I think all in their different ways are sort of symbols of death. Okay, and this is again what Keats is telling us to avoid. Okay? Don't let these be your... Um, your sort of your your way out, if you like, of, of melancholy. Your partner in your sorrows, mysteries. Now, mysteries, I think, is a is an interesting word here because I think for the first time, it's uh, Keats is, is sort of alluding to the to perhaps some of the kind of the positives of 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 melancholy. If they are mysterious, perhaps they have hidden value. Okay, so I'm going to just uh, just make that. An annotation um, hidden uh, hidden value, so perhaps this this word mysteries sorrows mysteries suggests that there is um there is something of value within um w within melancholy, um, and one other thing to note sorry I should have said it on the on the way down is that actually um, even though Keats's tone is is this sort of very imperative um, one telling us you know don't do this. Um, he does, I think, also acknowledge the temptation of dealing with one's melancholy in this way. I mean, if you look at some of the images, again, that he uses, you know, poisonous wine. Now, you know, wine obviously, you know, has has kind of connotations of, um, you know, of drunkenness and, and drowsiness. But it's, you know, it can also be um, a, a delicious drink. And so he's acknowledging, I think, that this is a, a real temptation. Equally, you know, nor suffer thy pale forehead to be kissed by nightshade. By nightshade, um, this is quite a sort of gentle, beautiful image. You know, the idea of having one's forehead kissed. We can see the sort of the temptation here of going down this route. Equally, the rosary of yewberries. Um, you know, people might find comfort in using religion um, in, in this way, or of um, you know that there can be comfort to be found. In here, Keats isn't saying that these are sort of all unambiguously bad things. He's simply saying that they are, according to him, not the correct way to deal with one's melancholy, with one's feelings of extreme sadness. And in the last two lines of the first stanza, he he again he sort of develops his argument a little bit further, um, and and explains why he is uh, why he is saying this. He's saying. For shade to shade will come too drowsily and drown the wakeful anguish of the soul. So I think shade to shade actually is probably um, worth highlighting because this really, I think, uh, these, the, the, this, um, this line really sort of captures w uh, a little bit about what's, what's going on here. So I think the first shade is the melancholy itself, okay? And obviously it has all these connotations of sort of you know, darkness and sadness and so on. But the the other shade is is the kind of the shade of choosing to um, to, to to sort of go down these sort of darker avenues to to avoid the melancholy. Okay, so for shade to shade, so the the kind of all of these um, sort of dark ways of dealing with sadness will actually approach the original sadness, the melancholy. And, and what will happen, it will come, it will, um, come too drowsily. Okay, so this idea of, you know, being sleepy or sort of even unconscious. Okay, and this really is what, um, uh, it really is what Keats is, um, is is arguing for he's saying that we need to be conscious of our melancholy we cannot um we cannot ignore it we cannot um sort of uh get rid of it um we cannot hide um hide away from it behind sort of intoxication or or, or anything else um because the effect of that would be to drown the wakeful anguish of the soul now this i think is a really um sort of uh beautiful summary of um, of what Keats is saying. He's saying that we shouldn't be unconscious, we should be wakeful, okay? So we need to be alert to the 
anguish of the soul. Um, and this, the anguish of the soul, I think, again, refers to the melancholy um, that, he, that he is referring to. Um, and this is, a, I think, a really interesting, um, perhaps, perhaps slightly hard idea to grasp, the idea that actually, you know, we should embrace sadness. We shouldn't try and shy away from it. We shouldn't try and sort of hide from it. Instead, actually, it's something to be accepted and something to be uh, to be embraced. So, um, that really is, uh, is is the sort of the, the summary, if you like, of the of the first stanza. He's saying, you know, don't don't do these things. Do not hide away from melancholy, because ultimately it will drown the wakeful anguish of the soul, that alertness, um, that acceptance, I suppose, of our true feelings. Okay, and in the second stanza. Um, having told us in the first stanza what not to do, in the second stanza he sort of actually um, starts to give perhaps a, an alternative to um, to sort of drowning our sorrows or, or forgetting our sorrows. Because he says um, instead, so but, so this word tells us that actually he's, he's sort of giving us an alternative here. So don't do this, but what you can do is this. When the melancholy fit shall fall sudden from heaven, like a weeping cloud that fosters the droop-headed flowers all and hides the green hill in an April sh shroud, then glut thy sorrow on a morning rose. Okay, so um, obviously the, the idea continues actually beyond where I just I stopped reading, but let's, um, let's deal with the, with the first bit. So he's saying, so when the melancholy fit shall fall, so in other words, when you feel this powerful sense of melancholy, and notice the way that it falls sudden, and this enjambment, I think, um, between uh, between lines uh, one and two of the second uh, second stanza, really helps actually mirror the way in which this sadness can just come upon a person quite quickly, um, very suddenly, when the melancholy fit shall fall sudden um, from heaven, like a weeping cloud, and he uses this... Um, simile of a, of a sort of rain cloud, I suppose, to, um, to illustrate how, how that melancholy uh, c can feel. And obviously it's quite an apt, apt uh, simile if we think about it, because, um, you know, we think of clouds and, and rain as a kind of an image of, of perhaps sadness, depression, um, that, that kind of thing. So I'm just going to note down uh, that that is, a, that is a simile and we can think about what the effect is. Um, because he then goes on to say that actually this weeping cloud, it isn't all bad, because what does it do? Well, it fosters the droop-headed flowers all, okay, and this word fosters is interesting. I think, you know, we could um, sort of say that uh, it means something along the lines of nurtures um, or, you know, helps grow, um, as rainfall obviously actually actually does, um, the droop-headed flowers all. So, you know, notice even the flowers here described as droop-headed, and again, perhaps that itself could be said to, to be an, an image of, um, of melancholy with their sort of their heads down. Um, and what else does the, does the rain cloud do? Well, it hides the green hill in an April shroud. Now, shroud, I think, is, again, quite an interesting word um, to, to look at because... Um, on the one hand, uh, it has very strong connotations of, of death. It's a sort of um, cloth that, um, that dead people um, are sort of buried and wrapped in. Um, so I'm going to say here, cloth associated with death. But, um, but equally, I think, you know, the shroud could be said to be sort of protecting. So I'm going to say sort of or protecting the green hill. It's a sort of like a, like a garment almost. Um, for for it to, to to wear, but he's saying when this happens, when you feel this melancholy, and then gives this sort of Im imagery to sort of illustrate what that melancholy might feel like, he says here this is what you should do. Another imperative: then glut thy sorrow on a morning rose. Now, glut is a very very interesting word. It means to sort of um, feast upon, almost I suppose. So. Um, feast on your sorrow okay so really feel it embrace it lean into it don't try and sort of run away from it glut thy sorrow um on a morning rose and so he's saying instead of instead of um sort of ignoring your melancholy look at the beauty around you try and sort of almost feed this sorrow with with beauty but notice the things that he identifies in in nature 
And this is, uh, Keats was a, ro a romantic poet, and so, um, you know, he wrote a lot about nature and about the beauty within nature. But look at the images that he chooses. So, um, it says, Glut they saw it on a morning rose. Now, a morning rose, this is a very um, temporary beauty, isn't it? You know, the implication is if it's a morning rose, by afternoon, maybe it'll be gone or it'll be, it'll be dying. Um, and morning, obviously, is also um, not spelled like this, but if we added a U in here, it'd be morning, as in morning and a death, or, um, you know, also something linked very, very closely with sadness. And we can, you know, we can talk about that in our essays, this idea that um, it's called, the technical term is a, a homophone. Um, so it sounds like another word, morning, uh, as in as in sadness. Um, and this temporary image of the of the morning rose, or he gives alternative things that we can um, sort of look to in in nature, um, or on the rainbow of the salt sound wave. And again, rainbow, very very clever image that Keats is is using here because um, obviously rainbows are associated with beauty. But let's think about how they're created. You know, it's a mixture, isn't it, of the sunshine, um, perhaps representative of um, of beauty and of joy and of happiness, but also of rain, um, perhaps symbolizing, uh, you know, the sadness and, and the melancholy, um, and of the salt sand wave. Uh, so again, you know, a, a wave, it's something fleeting, it's something that comes and then, and then goes quite quickly. So I think Keats is really here emphasizing that beauty, natural beauty, in fact, all beauty, um, is, is temporary. It doesn't last forever, but that actually that is what makes it beautiful that it's fleeting, that it's not something that we can hold on to forever. Um, uh, I've highlighted here as a sort of structural point as well. Um, the, the, this is called uh, the repetition of um, or, or, or in three consecutive lines. Um, if we have repeated words at the start of consecutive lines like this, it's called anaphora. Okay. And I think, um, you know, well, you might have your own ideas about what the effect of the anaphora here is, but I think at least one of them perhaps is to show us that there are, there is so much beauty um, in, in nature. There are so many things that we can embrace within nature to sort of um, embrace our, our melancholy and to sort of see the beauty in nature and, and not to sort of run away from our feelings of sadness, but simply to experience them, but also to see um, the, the, the beautiful things as, as well. Um, and then he kind of changes tack slightly because he's given us all these sort of natural uh, images of beauty, the, um, the morning rose, the rainbow, of the salt sand wave, the globed peonies, so more uh, flowers, um, which again, you know, temporary, they, they live, but then they die. Um, and then he moves on to... Um, to a slightly different image, he says, or if thy mistress, so here, you know, he's addressing the reader and, and saying if, his, if the reader's mistress, um, the, uh, the, a lover, um, some rich anger shows. Um, so again, you know, we've got this a kind of perhaps a, a, a negative image, but also it's a, it's a rich anger. And I think, you know, we could almost argue here that this is, this is an oxymoron. Um, and just a, a reminder of what that is, that's when we put two words with um, sort of opposite meanings side by side. The classic example I always use is, um, is bittersweet, um, but here a rich anger. So, you know, anger obviously is something um, normally that we would associate with kind of a negative, uh, a negative sense, but actually it's a rich anger. Is there something in that anger that we can use that we can embrace that we can learn from so it's a, a rich anger shows and here's what he says you should do imprison her soft hand and let her rave so in other words take her hand and and listen to her anger listen to what she's saying and feed deep deep upon her peerless eyes this word feed is interesting isn't it because i think you know perhaps linking with this idea of it being rich we can we can sort of gain something from this there is some emotional truth if you like to be to be had to be to be fed upon to be um uh, to be taken from what appears to be a sort of an, a negative situation and feed deep deep upon her peerless eyes and here we have this um beautiful sounding uh assonance um the repeated 
fowl sounds and feed deep, deep upon her peerless eyes, which I think sort of mirrors this idea of embracing it, of taking it all in. I think the assonance really helps uh, it helps create that, that sense. Um, and so we move on to, um, to, to stanza three, which again develops the argument in a, in a slightly different direction. Um, Keats begins with uh, the word she, and we might assume that that refers back to uh, to the mistress, and um, I don't think that's necessarily an incorrect reading, but um, one other way to read it at least would be to say that, um, that the she here is a personification of melancholy itself. Okay, because obviously that is what this entire poem is about, and I think really um, here now we get to the heart of um, of Keats's argument. So she, melancholy perhaps, dwells with beauty, beauty that must die. So here Keats is really emphasising how completely interconnected beauty and sadness are. And in fact... Here in the second half of the line, after we've got this, um, we've got this repetition, um, beauty that must die. It, Keats seems to be saying that it is because beauty must die that it is beautiful. It is precisely the fact that life is fleeting, that everything eventually dies, is that it is that that gives it beauty. Um, so. I think this really gets to gets the heart of um, of what Keats is saying, um, and he sort of develops again, and he he talks not just about beauty but joy. Okay, so another um, example of personification here, um, joy is being personified um, as somebody whose hand is ever at his lips, bidding adieu. Okay, so adieu um, uh, or adieu, if we want to uh, to say the um, correct French pronunciation, um, is goodbye. Okay, so. Of saying goodbye, so um, joy, even joy, you know, something that should be so positive, should be um, uh, full of happiness, but it is saying goodbye, it is bidding adieu, okay, and aching pleasure as well. So, here again, we have what I, I think you know could be argued as uh, another oxymoron, really, you know, aching suggesting a sort of a pain, but pleasure suggesting this joy. But again, Keats is simply saying that these things, they are not separate. We do not have on the one hand sadness and on the other hand joy, but they are fundamentally part of the, the, the same thing. Um, uh, and aching pleasure and I turning to poison while the bee mouth sips. So we have this um, beautiful, like detailed image of a um, of a bee, perhaps um, sipping at a at a flower, but um, but the nectar turning to poison. You know, at the very moment that the bee is there um, sipping uh, sipping on the flower. So again, you know, these things cannot be separate separated. Um, beauty and melancholy. They are two sides, if you like, of the of the same coin. Um, and and Keats uh, now goes uh, onto this really, I think, striking uh, image. I, um, so this is just a, a, a sort of an affirmation, a confirmation. And so like, yes, this is, this is what I'm saying. I, in the very temple of delight, veiled melancholy has her sovereign shrine. Wow, okay, let's unpick this a little bit. So, um, in the Temple of Delight, so this image of, um, of, of a sort of a, a religious building, I suppose, um, devoted to delight, to joy, to happiness, within this building, veiled melancholy has her sovereign shrine. Now, a shrine is a place where um, people go to, to pray. It's sort of almost the holiest part, if you like, within a, a religious building. And so he's saying that actually, within delight, within joy, the, the very core of it, the very heart of it, the very shrine within this temple is melancholy. Okay, so again, the two simply cannot be separated. Um, they are they are fundamentally part of the of of the same thing. Um, but this is not easy to see, and I can imagine um, you know people listening to this being like, well, they're not the same thing, are they? You know, you have joy on the one hand and you have sadness on the other. Um, and I think Keats sort of acknowledges that this is not necessarily something that is very easy um, for people to understand or to accept, because he says. Um, 
this shrine of of melancholy within the within the temple of delight um, can can be seen of none. So in other words, nobody can see this save him. So accept him. So accept the person who's strenuous, all of its connotations of hard work. He accepts this is not an easy task. Um, whose strenuous tongue can burst joy's grape against his palate fine. So if we are bursting joy's grape, then we are um, acknowledging that it is temporary, that it is something that will will pass. You know, if something bursts, it was there, um, and then it's gone. So it's a, a sort of a fleeting um, or passing moment. Um, but this is how we, we sort of, we learn to understand this. Um, we burst joy's grip against his palate fine, and I think fine is interesting. It sort of suggests a kind of, perhaps a, a sensitivity um, to, 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 these, uh, to these ideas, to beauty and to melancholy and, and to nature. Um, this person's soul shall taste the sadness of her might. Okay, the her referring back to the personification at the start of the stanza, um, to, to melancholy. Um, and it is this person who can sort of accept this relationship, um, who will be able to, um, to sort of to taste the sadness of her might, her power, if you like, and be among her cloudy trophies hung. Now, this is a really, I think, quite a sort of a, a strange image, um, but it's suggesting that actually, if we can approach melancholy, if we can approach sadness this way, then um, then we can become um, a, a, a sort of a trophy of, of melancholy. It makes me think of... Um, uh, of like a, a stag's head or something, you know, up on up on the wall in a in a hunting club or or something along those lines. But um, you know, a trophy obviously also has connotations of, um, of of victory, and I think perhaps this is um, this is what Keats is uh, is suggesting is that if we can take this approach, if we can see um, melancholy this way, then actually um, there is a sort of there is a victory in that. There is a kind of a deep understanding in that. Um, so I hope that that has um, provided a little bit of clarity uh, on the poem. There is so much to say here, and as I mentioned at the start, um, a lot has been written about this beautiful, beautiful poem. So um, please do, um, you know, especially if you're aiming for a top, top grade, please do go and, um, and, and read more about it, learn more about it. There is a lot of depth in this poem and a lot of beauty in this poem. So um, hopefully that was a good, um, good place for you to start. Uh, but if you have any specific questions, obviously, please do um, feel free to speak to one of your English teachers or you can um, put a question in the comments below and uh, I'll do my best to get back to you. All right.